In this section of the course, we're moving on to the principles of administrative law that are used in judicial review. And it's worth remembering that while these don't apply specifically to merits review, they form part of our approach to governance and approach to good government that will inform those decisions. So you can't use these as principles or as um, precedents in a merits review, but they certainly are strong arguments that you can construct a merits review argument around. Um, this week we're looking at jurisdictional error, um, which used to be called ultra vires, which I think is a nicer term, um, makes a bit more sense, even though it's Latin, but we seem to have um, adopted the convention now that we talk about jurisdictional error instead, I think, in the belief that it's um, more plain English. But you, it's actually created more confusion because as you read through materials on admin law, you'll find both referred to. So really, when we talk about jurisdictional error, ultra vires, um, we're talking about the same thing. More confusion next week when we look at natural justice and procedural fairness, which again are the two different terms, same thing. All right, so where does the idea of jurisdictional error come from? Well, it comes from, as your notes point out, the legality principle, and that's the idea that, and this is ties back to that idea of rule of law, no one is above the law, even government. And it's a response to the argument that governments often try to make, and um, Richard Nixon tried to make this argument around the uh, Watergate break-ins, that if the government does something, it's not illegal, because they're the government and they can make the laws. It's certainly not true. Governments are bound by constitution and they're bound by their own legislation as a matter of um, form. So there's a quite an in-depth discussion in the notes establishing the legality principle and why it's relevant. It may be one of those things that you just sort of think, well, why are we looking at this? And, and I suppose the answer is you can just, as long as you accept <coughs> that the government is bound by its own laws, it's fine, but as soon as someone s raises that challenge and says, but we're not bound by this because we're the government, the courts have had to actually try and establish logically and reasonably why they are bound. And um, it does it does seem like a, an argument that goes around in circles a lot, but um, that would be the reason why. So when we're talking about um, jurisdictional error, it's that concept that Governments, once there's a um, legislation that sets up a set of powers, are bound to follow the legislation in the way in which they, they exercise those powers. And if they act either outside those powers or in excess of those powers, there's trouble. So outside the powers is when you, you know, the dog catcher has the power to catch dogs and starts catching children instead and says, well, it's the same thing really, isn't it? And they're certainly not. The excess of power is when the dog catcher has the power to catch dogs and impound them to get people to pay fines and decides to go around shooting dogs instead or starts reselling the dogs that they've caught. Um, it starts with a power they legitimately have, unlike the power to catch children, um, but they've, they've moved outside that power in excess of it. And that's where the foundation of, of ultravirus really comes from. There's two scenarios. One is when there's no power at all, and they're just acting completely on their own. And the other is when they do have power, but they exceed what they're able to do. Returning to what we looked at two weeks ago, we have to remember that administrative review only applies to things that are directly authorised by legislation. So there's a whole series of things that governments do that are not reviewable uh, because they're not um, part of that legislative um, they're not, they're, they're not constructed on and under and bound by legislative power. So things like um, public relations, managing property, entering into contracts, employing people, disciplining employees, um, involving in litigation, there's a whole lot of things that the government kind of does as part of its business that is not reviewable under judicial review. Some of those things are, however, however reviewable as under merits review. So that's not necessarily the end of the story. but. We must remember that all the time that with um, um, judicial review, it has to be something that is a piece of legislation that says this office, this person has the power to do X for these reasons under these, under these terms. And I guess this is where we move into the ways in which you can exceed jurisdiction. And there's really in the case law and in the legislation three fundamental ways. One is in the purpose to which you exercise a power. 
two is taking into account um, irrelevant considerations, and three is failing to take, take into account relevant considerations. So where there's a blatant excess of power, where you just do something you're not supposed to do, that's usually fairly clear. You don't need to establish any of this. But where there's a exercise of power that's not quite right, this is where we need to we need to dig into these things. So first of all, is the purpose that's used. It's not being done for the authorised purpose. Second, irrelevant considerations is being taken into consideration. And third, uh, relevant considerations are not being taken into consideration. So let's look at those three in turn. First of all, the purpose of the legislation. Here we're talking at um, section 5, subsection 2, subsection C of the ADJR Act. And this also comes out of the um, Ironmongers case. And this is the idea that um, if legislation is granted for grants power for a particular purpose and you use it for another purpose, and you start mixing those things up, you end up in trouble. Now, this sounds better in theory than it often is in practice. Because first of all, back in the past, legislation very rarely said what its purpose is. We, it does more today, and we'll come to that in a moment. But often it was difficult to establish, first of all, what the purpose of the legislation was originally. And second of all, well, what was the purpose for which the um, they did exercise the power? Because bureaucracies are very good at saying, well, we're only, we're only resuming your land for the, all the most appropriate purposes. Uh, we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't do it for the wrong reasons, when in fact they are operating for the wrong reasons. And one of the big cases on that was Tui's case. And that was a situation where um, a town planning uh, power was used to try and defeat native title claims and land rights claims. And that was a clear example where they could actually see there was no real purpose in redefining those, those town boundaries under the law. And the only real purpose it had was to use that power in a sneaky way to try and defeat um, uh, Aboriginal land rights claims. Um, it was pre-native title, actually. So sometimes you have a rare situation where someone is so blatant and so obvious that you can see the purpose is not aligned with legislation, but often it's, it's um, more ambiguous. And there is problems too when there are mixed purposes. You know, if you're, if you're doing it for this reason and this reason, is it 70-30, is it 90-10? Well, what's the breakdown of the, of the reasons? Because you can have mixed reasons, and that creates problems as well. The other thing I'd, I want to mention is that the um, some of the more effective changes that have come in this area have not been through changing the law or the way in which these things are reviewed, but have come about through changing the way in which we draft legislation. So while determining the, the um, purpose of legislation had a very technical, um, you know, very much tied up with statutory interpretation as to figuring out what the purpose is, Today, legislation is drafted with a clear statement of what the purpose is, and that makes it a lot easier to determine whether an exercise of power, and this is for everyone, for the, for the, for the bureaucrats, for the public, and potentially for the judges if it ever comes to review, becomes very much an easier exercise to determine what the purpose of the legislation is. And this gets back to, I think, what's a, the core theme in this course is the power of design. And this is an example of design thinking and operation and being very, very successful that if you're focused on the problem of a judicial review and um, jurisdictional error in terms of purpose, was constantly to look at, well, how can we find more um, statutory interpretation tools to understand what the legislation is, then they're never going to improve. Whereas the simple design-oriented approach was to say, let's just from now on fix the way in which we create legislation. Let's improve it so this isn't going to be a problem in the future. That's a design solution to a problem, and that's not necessarily an obvious solution to people who are lawyers, because people who are lawyers tend to focus on the conflict part of the problem, not the avoiding conflict and stopping that ha of happening in the first place, unfortunately. Um, but some lawyers are, and, and obviously um, there's, been a, there's a, enough of a critical mass of design thinkers in this area, although they wouldn't call it that themselves, to um, change the way we go about creating legislation. Okay, so that's an invalid purpose. The other two parts of jurisdictional error that are important are involve relevant and irrelevant considerations. It's much easier to understand where there are irrelevant considerations, or at least where they're, they're overtly brought into consideration, 
Um, this is section, section, section um, 52, section 5, subsection 2, subsection A, sorry, of the ADJR Act. And probably one of the big cases on that is the Murphy Orr's case. And that's where it was, the court stated that if you take into account corrupt or personal considerations in making a decision, then that's a decision that's not, that, that is ultra vires, that it's, it's, it's outside jurisdiction. Because your jurisdiction to exercise that power is only, for pro, is only for proper purposes. And for proper purposes, you've got to take into account only the relevant considerations, not the irrelevant ones. Now, you might be thinking here, well, how is that different to proper purpose? And the fact is it isn't. These things all overlap, as we both have seen all the way through admin law. They're different arguments that can be raised, and they often pertain to exactly the same behaviour. So hopefully getting used to that by now. But as I've mentioned previously, it can be a bit of an uphill battle when you're used to law fitting very nicely into different containers and separate containers, because admin law is, is very much about those overlaps. So the Murphy Orr's case talks about corrupt and personal considerations. Um, these things include things like not liking the applicant. There's a case um, that's referred to in the notes which talks about um, when the, um, a, a, an authority disapproved of a person's occupation or disapproved of that person. And those are examples of the sort of the irrelevant things. And again, this really does rely on those bodies being a bit unprofessional and actually when they hand out a decision saying and by the way we don't like you and that's why we're not giving you this permit or whatever and where people are more professional and are not so obvious and don't state these things these things are much harder to prove and again this is a, I suppose another theme in admin law is it's often about the process being fair and looking fair and above board rather than necessarily being fair and above board but it's, 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 it's a, sl a small thing to ask. Um, and moving on from um, irrelevant considerations, failure to take into account what are relevant considerations. And again, this is a, this is a matter of um, degree, but sometimes legislation will say quite overtly, and the things to consider are, and here's a list, might, might not be an exhaustive list, things to consider include might be a, B, C, D, E. Now, if the board or the authority or the decision maker doesn't take into account something significant there, again, that can be a grounds for jurisdictional error. And say, well, the, it's obviously the decision wasn't properly made because they didn't take into account this very, very important thing. Now here, and that's under Section 5, Subsection 2, Subsection B of the ADJR Act. Now, at this point, we're also walking the line where the courts do seem to be on the edge of substituting their opinion for the opinion of the original decision maker, and that's a no-no. That's something they're not allowed to do. So this is why a lot of the language around the cases here is, is very particular, very pernickety, uh, because the, the courts don't want to be in a position where they say, we don't like the decision that was made, Therefore, this is the decision we would have made. Therefore, we're invalidating the decision. They can't do that. What they can do is they can say is the decision was made in such a bad way that it doesn't actually conform to the grant of power under legislation. Therefore, it's, it's, it's a legal nullity. It's, it's an illegal decision. It's null. And we return it to the decision to be made. And this also segues nicely into something we're going to talk about two weeks from now, which is the unreasonableness principle. And that's a whole new kettle of fish, where a decision made, is made in a way that is so unreasonable, or manifestly so unreasonable, that it just can't possibly be... Um, a no, no reasonable person would make that decision. Now, that doesn't happen all that often, but this is, again, a bit of a thin edge of the wedge to make other arguments around a decision. So at what point the considerations you use and the purpose you use actually blend over into actual unreasonableness is an interesting point. Now, fortunately, we don't have to rely on common law, common law categories because this is all in the ADJR Act. And all these elements are all parts of that one argument. So you don't have to say, you know, this was either a relevant consideration or the failure to take into a relevant consideration or it was unreasonable. You make an argument based on all these things.
you actually compile an argument that looks at all these things that are required that were not that were not completed. So okay, that's a very quick introduction to jurisdictional error. More in the readings, more in the textbook on that. And next week we'll look on natural justice slash procedural fairness, which is an, another aspect of the same problem. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to keep the the, 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 the subtle differences between those things clear.